Science Fiction University. Hello, and welcome to Science Fiction University. In our last episode, we discussed what happens when AI goes horribly wrong by diving into the 1970 cult classic, Colossus the Forbin Project. This week, on an episode we're calling Good Robot, Bad Robot, we look at the upside of AI in science fiction as seen through the eyes of the great bird of the galaxy, Gene Roddenberry. We're your fan and writer hosts. I'm Blue Gal. And I'm Drift Glass, and I realize that we're not going to talk about robots. We're going to talk about androids and AI, but it just makes a better title, I think. Good Robot, Bad Robot. And you can visit us at Science Fiction University at our website, sciencefictionuniversity.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution to Science Fiction University, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. Today, we're going to spoil a 50-year-old, not nearly as good as Drift Glass <laughs> remembered it, movie. Yes, we are. About an android called Questor that laid the foundation for one of the most successful and beloved characters in Star Trek. This movie, called The Questor Tapes, is available on DVD from Amazon, but we do not recommend that you buy it. No. It, and we literally had to look everywhere until we found it on, because it's not streaming anywhere, and yep. now I know why. But I thought this was a great <laughs> movie when I was 14 years old. You know, I thought, oh, man, this is so cool. And I think um, in terms of history, it's an important movie. It is. And we're, we're really going to talk about why. Yeah. And we're, yeah, we're talking about it as writers today, about how writers develop and think and, and work through their ideas and how they evolve over time. Now, that character in the Quester tapes, the character that would later grow out of that failed experiment known as the Quester tapes, would be Lieutenant Commander Data, played by Brent Spiner, who appeared in... Get this, Blue Gal. He appeared as Data in 176 episodes of the TV series Star Trek The Next Generation, all four Star Trek TNG movies, in Star Trek Final Unity and Generations and Away Team and Hidden Evil and Bridge Commander video games, and in four episodes of the short-lived Star Trek Enterprise TV series, and in 14 episodes of Star Trek Picard. So he is a very popular character. And if you want to be reductive, the story of Data is essentially the story of Pinocchio, but without the wicked companions who tempt him into bad behavior. All the bad behavior is largely carried out by Data's android brother, Lore. In the pilot episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, Commander Riker explicitly refers to Data as Pinocchio. But your file says that you're a... Machine, the... correct, sir. Does that trouble you? To be honest, yes. A little? Understood, sir. Prejudice is very human. Now that does trouble me. Do you consider yourself superior to us? I am superior, sir, in many ways. But I would gladly give it up to be human. Nice to meet you, Pinocchio. That reference is called back when Data is court-martialed in the Next Generation episode, The Measure of a Man, when Riker is forced to prosecute and prove that Data is just a machine who has no right to refuse an order to be disassembled. Riker knows where Data's off switch is, and during his summary, Riker steps behind Data and shuts him down. It's responses dictated by an elaborate software written by a man. It's hardware built by a man. And now, and now a man will shut it off. Pinocchio is broken. Its strings have been cut. So here are some things you need to know about Gene Roddenberry, who is the man who created the character of Data. Roddenberry was a humanist who, with Star Trek and Quester, was doing something that is fairly rare in written or televised science fiction. He was telling uplifting stories about humanity's bright future, where there are still problems, but they're mostly ethical dilemmas which can be solved with intelligence and empathy. But those stories are always contingent on us getting our act together and living up to our full potential. And since Roddenberry was developing Star Trek in the 1960s, this meant that a lot of what he wrote used science fiction plots to critique the contemporary dangers that we were facing then and now. 
greed, bigotry, authoritarianism, senseless wars, and so on. This is quoting Gene Roddenberry now. By creating a new world with new rules, I could make statements about sex, religion, Vietnam, politics, and intercontinental missiles. Indeed, we did make them on Star Trek. We were sending messages, and unfortunately, they all got by the network. If you talked about purple people on a far-off planet, they, the network executives, never really caught on. They were much more concerned about cleavage. They actually would send a sensor down to measure a woman's cleavage to make sure too much of her breast wasn't showing, which is amazing to me. Yep. And if you're a Star Trek fan, surely you must have noticed that for dramatic purposes, every version of Star Trek has non-human characters who are there to comment on Earth history and the human condition. For example, in the original Star Trek, of course, Spock was that character. Like Quester, Spock was brilliant, logical, and physically strong and didn't use contractions. But unlike Quester, Spock was not ignorant of human history and behavior. Instead, he had an encyclopedic knowledge of human failings, of our wars and our tyrants. Spock was the series' frequent sardonic critic of human behavior. He didn't need human beings to help him navigate social situations or explain what sex is. Instead, what made Spock interesting was his ongoing internal battle to reconcile his Vulcan side with his human side. And just as an aside on Star Trek Voyager, there were two such characters. One was the Doctor, who was the emergency medical hologram, who became sentient over time uh, as he was never turned off. He just ran, he became part of the crew and was always curious about humanity because he was just a hologram. And Seven of Nine, who was born a human child and turned into a Borg and was always having conflicts about her human nature and her Borg nature and had, you know, bad things to say about humanity. This was a common thing in Roddenberry's writing. Today, the Star Trek franchise is estimated to be worth over $10 billion with a B dollars. But back in 1967, when NBC canceled it after only two seasons, no one could foresee that future. Then came a famous fan-based letter-writing campaign, after which NBC resurrected the show for one more season and put it in the worst time slot on television. Roddenberry threatened to quit if NBC didn't change the time slot. NBC refused. Roddenberry quit. And although it does have a few memorable episodes, Star Trek's final original season is pretty much universally considered to be much inferior to the first two. Then, for Roddenberry, came a long, lean decade between the cancellation of the original series and the first Star Trek movie. He got the animated series on the air, but that was about it. And this is quoting Gene Roddenberry again. For a couple of years, our only income was lecture fees I got from colleges where kids still love Star Trek, even though it was not a commercial success. Imagine that. The creator of Star Trek getting by on lecture fees from colleges. A lot of canceled shows had disappointed fans, but Star Trek fans were different. Yeah. They got organized. In 1972, the first major Star Trek convention was held in New York City with Roddenberry and Magil Barrett as special guests. Organizers expected about 600 attendees. Instead, 3,000 Trekkies showed up. Yeah! After a few more like that, the LA Times soon dubbed Star Trek the show that won't die. That's when Roddenberry started a mail order firm called Lincoln Enterprises that cranked out Star Trek props and costumes, copies of original scripts, keychains, and of course, tribbles. Mm -hmm. During these years, Roddenberry took a lot of swings, but nothing really connected. He hoped to develop a series about Tarzan's Lord Greystoke persona, but it never made it past the first draft of a script. Then there was his pilot for an assignment Earth, starring Robert Lansing and Terry Garr, which was shot as a second season episode of Star Trek. If the series had ever spun off, it would have followed Gary Seven, a human who had been raised and trained by aliens to prevent Earth from destroying itself. Now stick a pin in that. We'll be returning to Gary Seven later. Yeah, it, it's a theme. Meanwhile, Roddenberry produced a movie that failed, and wrote scripts for other TV shows like Alias Smith & Jones. 
In the summer of 1973, the animated Star Trek got underway, and another pilot for a proposed series called Genesis 2 went into production. It was about a 20th century research scientist who awakens from suspended animation to a post-apocalyptic world, and it was never made into a series. Uh, ABC was interested in the idea, so Roddenberry took Genesis 2 and he tweaked it, and it was reshot as Planet Earth, which was also never made into a series. With that in mind, Roddenberry and frequent Star Trek writer Gene L. Kuhn took many of the elements from Star Trek and made the Quester tapes, which was basically Mr. Spock in a buddy show format. In fact, Leonard Nimoy was supposed to be the lead and had agreed to do the weekly series if Quester was picked up, but he was dropped at the last minute by Roddenberry, who apparently never got around to telling Nimoy, who thought he was still the lead until he ran into the guy who'd been hired for the part, Robert Foxworth, on the studio lot. Really? I know. Wild. The Quester tapes aired on NBC in 1974. The plot is that an emotionless, super-powered android is assembled according to the designs of a mysterious engineer and scientist named Vaslovic. But the villain of our story, the head of the project named Jeffrey Darrow, played by Dean Vernon Wormer himself, John Vernon, messes things up by partially ruining the original Android programming tape by attempting to decode it and then trying to use the project's own tape to program the Android. Over the strong objections of Dr. Jerry Robinson, played by Mike Farrell. When that fails, the team tries to use the partially erased original Vaslovic tape to try and boot up the Android. And when that seemingly fails, they close up the high security lab for the night and leave. But aha! Questor the Android was just faking. It was awake and aware and used some high-tech 3D printing gadgets that just happened to be lying around the lab to give itself human features, thus making it possible for it to move around undetected, and sparing the actor the agony of shooting the entire movie in a weird-looking, flesh-colored, head-to-toe rubber leotard. Yeah, no. Uh, so in quick succession, we learn four things. Number one. Questor is programmed to find his creator, but something has gone wrong. His, his original Vasilovic programming tape contained all that information and code that would have made Questor into an empathic creature that could feel emotions. But, oh no, the damage to the tape ruined all that, thus creating the plot necessity for... Number two, Questor will need a human partner to help him find his creator. And he'd better hurry because... Number three, there is a ticking clock because Quester was built with all kinds of radically advanced technology that must not fall into the hands of humanity until we are wise enough to use it. Therefore, Quester is programmed to self-destruct after a certain number of hours if he can't find his creator and not self-destruct neatly and quietly like a good android, but convert himself into a fusion bomb. Unfortunately, number four, in hot pursuit, is the villainous Jeffrey Darrow. And a word about the actor who plays him, John Vernon. In addition to being Dean Wormer of Animal House and the mayor in Dirty Harry and Curtis Mooney in Killer Clowns from Outer Space, mm -hmm. he was a sneaky, great TV bad guy during the 1960s and 1970s. He had such a great baritone villain voice. He did. He was very villainous. Yes and could project such arrogant authority that Mission Impossible used him as the antagonist three different times. So it would make sense that Roddenberry would cast him as the bad guy here, and he does a creditable job. But his character is also sort of ludicrous. It, it, it really kind of is, yeah. you, you sort of start ro rolling your eyes. Uh, the Quester Project team is supposed to be made up of five of the greatest scientists in the world who are, for some reason assembling an android out of parts they do not understand, according to the instructions of a mysterious super genius who has gone missing. Each of the individual parts of Quester, from its eyes to its atomic furnace stomach to its tiny pistons that are more powerful than anything anyone has ever seen, are centuries more advanced than current technology. 
yet they are not being studied individually, but assembled into an android in a lab on some unnamed college campus. Yeah. And the thing is, you and I as writers know why the plot requires each of these very bad decisions, because if they're not done, then the plot will not go anywhere. But it doesn't matter because the each step along the way, our eyes rolled a little bit more as it became clear that these are just thrown in as machine parts to get the plot going where Roddenberry wants it to go. Then Jeffrey Darrow shows up and takes over the project on some authority that's never explained. And when Mike Farrell's character objects, Darrow has him imprisoned and put under guard in his own apartment, which for some reason has bars on the windows. It's which is the weirdest weird. thing that he has the ability to put one of his scientists under house arrest. Under house arrest with an armed guard in a room that already has prison bars on the windows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Meanwhile, Quester, who now looks passably human, rips the lab steel doors off their hinges and heads over to the Vaslavic archives where all the top secret stuff is just sitting around on microfiche. It breaks in there. It chats up the librarian when it's caught, strolls over to Jerry's apartment, pries the bars off the windows, and helps him escape. And then it's off to England in search of his creator. They have no passports, but Quester talks them past security guards to Heathrow Airport because his programming just happens to include international travel law or something, and he knows of a loophole. In England, they contact Lady Helena Trimble, played by Dana Winter, and whose character name was a Roddenberry homage to Bajot Trimble, who had led the fan campaign to keep Star Trek on the air. That's really cute. That's really sweet. It really is. Lady Trimble's estate is the secret location of a Vaslavic Global Information Center, from which it's possible to spy on just about anybody in the world while videotaping their activities. Yeah, a lot of this plot is deeply problematic um, <laughs> from a real world point of view, but let's move on. Quester's fragmentary memory of a boat of some kind is the only clue it has as to the location of Vaslovic. While strolling around London with Jerry, he notices some children playing in a toy Noah's Ark. Suddenly, he remembers that Vaslovic is in or near Mount Ararat, which in the myth of Noah's Ark is where the Ark finally comes to rest. Then, Quester is gunned down by some trigger-happy soldiers in a park full of children. It's because, yeah. Because he has oh, no. to be, right? <laughs> and, and there was a dramatic moment that I actually remembered uh, from when I was 14 of Mike Farrell holding him and one of the guys saying, but there's no blood. And Mike Farrell going, there's blood everywhere, which is his commentary on the brutality and, and unfairness and savagery of humanity, I guess. But it's a pretty bad scene. Now, because apparently, in addition to being a scientist and head of the Quester Project, for some reason, Jeffrey Darrow has the authority to commandeer cars and aircraft and order the police and the, quote, UN military, unquote, around, <laughs> even in foreign countries, including telling them when and where they can bomb things and use, use lethal force. See, Dean Wormer with fighter jets is formidable and awesome. Uh, now, everyone now heads back to the laboratory, uh, which is in America, where Robinson repairs Questor, and Darrow gives him two options. If Robinson puts a homing transmitter inside the android, they will be given a plane to go find Veslovic. But if Robinson refuses, the android will be flown to a safe location where the explosion will not endanger anyone. Robinson implants the beacon, and off they go to Mount Ararat. Yay! We are now racing towards the big reveal at the movie's end. That Quester is the last in a long line of androids put here on Earth, quote, since the dawn of this world, unquote. That's a long time. By some advanced race of aliens to watch over humanity and nudge us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Each android lasts exactly 200 years and then assembles their replacement. All of the thousand of previous androids are laid out on slabs in a secret facility under Mount Ararat which can be accessed by slightly moving a large stone outside the entrance, which presumably only Quester has the strength to do, 
but Darrow manages the same feat using a piece of wood as a lever, you yeah. know, like you move a rock. Like you move, there's no, there's no voice recognition. There's nope. no eye scan. There's no password. It's like you move a rock slightly and boom, you're in. And boom, the door opens on the mountain. Mm -hmm. However, radiation from human nuclear testing has messed up many of Vasilovic's functions. So he had to outsource the job of assembling his replacement to human scientists under the guise of a university project. So see, all questions are it, answered. It's right? all explained right there. <laughs> so obvious. This um, flaw caused by nuclear testing has been fixed in Questor, who will now be able to live out his full span of 200 years. And will be the last of humanity's secret android helpers, because if humanity can survive the next two centuries, then we'll be fine. Yeah. And, and that's that's something you do find in Roddenberry's, in a lot of the Star Trek. There's this period at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, when we're very close to destroying ourselves, mm -hmm. but we make it through. And we survive and we move on, etc. So th that's a pretty common theme you'll see in, in what he writes. Now, this begs some pretty big plot and world-building questions. Like, for instance, how the hell could aliens who set all this up, quote, 200 millennia ago, unquote, know that humanity would need no more and no less than exactly this many android helpers? Now, since Quester has no emotional component, Vaslovic tasks Jerry with being his conscience and his moral teacher, and Jerry accepts the assignment. Barrow enters the scene and gives his opinion, which is human beings are selfish animals who will never make it, but he gets his redemption by running down the mountain with a deactivated tracking device and telling the UN army that the android has escaped with a couple of nukes and that they need to stop it at any cost. Barrow then jumps into his private jet, so now he's a pilot too, flying off and turning on the tracking device so the UN force can shoot him down, thinking they've stopped Quester, leaving Jerry and Quester to go off and have adventures in buddy science fiction TV series that never actually happened. So Barrow sacrifices himself for the possibility that humanity might survive, which is a, which is a noble sentiment. There are some big ideas in the movie, but it suffers from too many big moral declaration monologues, too many characters whose motivations seem unnatural. A serious timeline problem. Yeah. They real. zip from England to the U.S. to repair Quester, then zip back across the world to Mount Ararat. And there's a ticking bomb inside Quester. And this all has to happen within a matter of hours, apparently. Mm -hmm. And there's just too many coincidences as well. So as a movie, it ain't great. But as a warm-up for Data in Star Trek, it's a very interesting record of where Roddenberry's head was at and what kind of story he wanted to tell and why he would need a starship in the 24th century to tell it. <laughs> yeah, none of this works in contemporary times. And, and he mm -hmm. tried, bless his heart. He did try to launch a couple of other series. There was Magna One about a race of future people who live under the sea and Battlefield Earth which had humans living as slaves to aliens, and this weird supernatural thriller called Spectre, which paired Gig Young and Robert Culp as two paranormalists battling evil forces or something. However, let's not be too hard on Gene Roddenberry. The state of televised science fiction in the 70s generally was overall pretty lame. Uh, Space 1999 was interesting, but the premise was ridiculous. The Incredible Hulk was The Fugitive, with Lou Ferrigno as the big green guy. Battlestar Galactica was appropriately nicknamed Battlestar Ponderosa by Harlan Ellison. The Six Million Dollar Man, I enjoyed it when I was a child. It was successful and fun. But then along came the very silly bionic woman. You remember her. She could she could activate her ear by moving her hair slightly out of the uh, out of, yeah, out of she range. She moved her hair and there was a close-up on her ear and that was all you needed. Yeah. <laughs> That it's, yeah. That's not how hearing works, anyone out there. <laughs> uh, there was Quark, which was kind of funny and cool. Uh, there was the Man from Atlantis, which was silly. There, and just for you, Blue Gal, there was Manimal. Manimal. I never yeah. missed a Manimal. They called me Franimal. Everybody's yeah. heard that story, right? Yeah. And and you were the one. You were the one who <laughs> was, saw every episode. I, I designated myself the one who would watch every Manimal because I knew it was going to be canceled in 
you know, seven episodes. And you were right. You've been and I right was right. right. <laughs> uh, there was a show called Future Cop, which I never saw. There was Logan's Run, the TV series, which was just terrible. There was Probe, which was the pilot for the Search TV series. And there was the Delphi Bureau, which is about a guy with photographic memory. And that's not all of them. There were lots more that were just just bad. Mm-hmm. So for science fiction fans, this era was a time of pretty slim pickings. And nothing Roddenberry was doing clicked. And then this movie called Star Wars... Yeah. Ever heard of it? Ever heard of it? Became the monster hit of 1977. And suddenly, science fiction was hot again, and the suits upstairs all wanted in on the Star Wars money pot, right? Yep. And here is Star Trek fandom, built in, already showing itself to be well-organized and loyal. Built-in audience. Let's go. So in 1979... The time for Star Trek, the motion picture, had finally arrived. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which I saw in a movie theater, (laughs) and I did not like it. It No. I mean, as as the first movie, the exciting part was getting to see everybody again, and then they needed to work on the plot, which for the second movie, they kind of did. The quality of the first four original Star Trek movies can charitably be described as mixed and uneven. Yeah. But they were successful enough financially that Paramount Pictures asked Roddenberry to develop a new series in the franchise. So after Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, Star Trek The Next Generation was born, which brings us back to the theme of this podcast that Questor was a scratch pad for Roddenberry to work out the ideas he would eventually incorporate into the character of data. Mm-hmm. Consider that like Questor, the Android data doesn't use contractions. And like Questor, data is strong, capable of tearing a steel door off its hinges. Like Questor, data can absorb information at an astounding rate, but Questor is stuck with microfiche readers and magazines instead of enterprise computers. Yeah, and like Questor, Data's ignorance of the nuances and rituals of human interaction leads to awkward and funny misunderstandings. Like Questor, Data was created by a brilliant but reclusive scientist who has mysteriously vanished and is presumed dead. And like Questor, Data is in the company of decent, ethical human beings who help guide him. In both cases, the most important link between humans and the AI android is friendship. And like Data in the Next Generation episode, The Royale, when Questor and his human companion need money to accomplish their goal, he heads to the craps table and uses his awesome android abilities to win enough money to meet their needs. In this case, the scene is virtually a remake of exactly the same scene in the Questor tapes, right down to each android squeezing the dice to carefully adjust the improperly balanced cubes to make it possible for them to roll winners every time. And and the Android can tell the difference between a loaded set of dice and an unloaded set of dice. Mm-hmm. And after winning enough money, they leave. In yeah. both cases. I, I had totally forgotten that scene. And when I saw it, I, oh, crap, that is almost shot for shot something they did in Star Trek. So then, mm-hmm. yeah, clearly this is Roddenberry you know, rough drafting stuff. Roddenberry also borrowed in the other direction from the original Star Trek to develop the character of Quester. So Quester's actions are to be limited by a non-interference doctrine that's almost identical to the same Star Trek's prime directive. And you remember way back, like a million years ago, when we talked about Assignment Earth, the Star Trek episode with Gary Seven, we mentioned that earlier about a human raised and trained by aliens to prevent Earth from destroying itself. That was Quester's purpose as well. The movie even has a Spock's brain moment when Quester had to verbally assist Jerry as Jerry performed delicate surgery on it while it was awake. There are even a couple of Star Trek veterans in the movie. To no one's surprise, you'll notice that Roddenberry cast his wife, Majel Barrett, in this pilot. She's a scientist. Mm -hmm. As he did in every show he created, there's Majel Barrett. But if you look closely, you'll notice that behind a big mustache and a wig, there's Walter Koenig. 
delivering a couple of lines as Barrow's administrative assistant. So I think this is a good place to close. And we're going to close with this quote by my friend, the late Harlan Ellison. Quote, a man does not write one novel at a time or even one quatrain at a time. He is engaged in the long process of putting his whole life on paper. He's on a journey and he is reporting in, this is where I think I am. And this is what this place looks like today, unquote. When looking back at the totality of Roddenberry's work, you can't miss the mile markers of his journey as a science fiction creator. He believed in humanity. He believed in the future. He believed that to get to that future, we as a species must leave our petty, greedy, warlike childhood behind. And he believed that artificial intelligence we create along the way could be our partner in that adventure. Yeah, it need not be a terrifying monster. So while the Quester tapes as a standalone television movie from 1974 does not stand the test of time, without it as a laboratory for Roddenberry to tinker with the idea of androids, we might never have gotten Lieutenant Commander Data. Say goodbye, Data. Goodbye, Data. Science Fiction University is a project of DGBG Productions. You can support the show by donating via Patreon. Details at our website, sciencefictionuniversity.com. Live long and prosper, everyone. See you next time.